All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I am Chris Shaw. I'm the director of product at Hypothesis. Uh, if you haven't heard from Hypothesis yet today, I, it's a social learning tool. We allow students to have conversations about the content uh, that they're, you know, that they're learning uh, directly in context on top of that context, uh, on top of that content. Um, I have with us today, we have Alex Humphreys, we've got Nick Brown and Dan Whaley, some very esteemed guests. I'll let them more properly introduce themselves here in a second, um, uh, right after a few points of order, and then we'll kind of get into it. So uh, briefly, if you look into the lower left, you probably have a panel, and in that panel, there is a chat button. Uh, it's got the ones with the little two speech bubbles on it. Um, feel free to use that to chat with each other and, uh, and you know, leave your thoughts and reactions throughout the, the panel. In fact, I will prompt you to do so in a couple of times to get your, your own input. Um, and in fact, why don't we go ahead and practice now? And I would love to kind of hear who's in the room and, you know, where are you based? Um, so go ahead and say hi to everybody. Um, in the meantime, there's also a Q&A tab at the top of that panel. And so as you have questions and uh, you know, potential things that you'd love the panelists to address, feel free to bring those up. And I actually realize now I'm going to show these points of order into a quick file here. Um, yeah, this one right here. Uh, feel free to drop those questions at any time. Uh, you can, in fact, vote on those questions if you see someone else has already added a question that you would love to have answered. And when it comes to the audience Q&A, we will uh, pull from those and allow the, the, our panelists here to, to take on your questions. And then lastly, um, I did mention that we'll have questions that you can kind of add those anytime. If there's things we don't get to, I will go ahead and collect those. And if you want, happy to kind of reach out to the panelists afterwards. They're nice people. Uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer those. So without further ado, I'll kind of get into the heart of this conversation. This is our social learning across content session. Um, you know, Digital content and instructional technologies have enabled new ways for social learning and education in general to take place. Uh, the problem is that, that you'll find today is that a lot of these times, these conversations that are happening are happening on in closed walled gardens, uh, if you will, where students' conversations are limited to only the content in one place and aren't able to take that conversation with them somewhere else. Um, there's ways to solve this, and uh, there is a coalition of, of uh, publishers, digital content providers, in instructors, and technology vendors are looking at ways that we can bring a new a vision of how social learning can work, where you can have this have the conversation across all content in the same way. Uh, and so, with that, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our lovely panelists. We've got Alex Humphreys from Ithaca Ventures and JSTOR Labs, Nick Brown at Vital Source, and then uh, someone that I am paid to say great things about. Dan Whaley here at Hypothesis. Uh, and so I'm going to pull down our slides here and allow our panelists to kind of shine. So why don't you guys introduce yourself? Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, uh, and why don't we go ahead and start with Dan? Hey, oh, thanks, Chris. Yeah, um, yeah my, I'm Dan Whaley. I'm the CEO founder here at Hypothesis. Um, and incredibly passionate about um, bringing this new open paradigm to kind of the world at uh, at large, but um, uh, also really focused um, uh, on how we can transform education uh, using these tools in the short term. And uh, so just thrilled to be here. Thank you. I think I'm on. I'm next on the list. So hi, my name is Alex Humphreys. I'm thrilled to be here. So thank you, Dan and 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 Chris for for having me. So uh, I'm the vice president for Ithaca Ventures and JSTOR Labs. Ithaca, for those who aren't familiar with it, is a uh, mission-driven not-for-profit. Um, its mission is to expand access to 
education and knowledge. Um, and it does so through a variety of uh, brands and services. Um, one of the most popular of which is JSTOR, which supports Ithaca's mission uh, with one of the most used research database digital libraries um, uh, on campus, college campuses in the world, uh, JSTOR. Uh, JSTOR Labs and Ithaca Ventures are ways in which that we explore and develop the next generation of how we fulfill our mission. So those are new products and, and services uh, that, that fulfill our mission. And uh, one thing we've been doing over the past uh, few years that we can talk about more is exploring a partnership with Hypothesis where JSTOR materials can be viewed through the Hypothesis LMS app um, to, as sort of a tunnel into JSTOR so that it can increase the impact and uh, availability of JSTOR content uh, within the teaching enterprise. Hand it over to Nick. All right, thanks, Alex. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Nick Brown at Vital Source. I'm a VP product here overseeing our learning platforms. Uh, and if you aren't familiar with Vital Source, um, we, we do a number of things, but um, one of the, the biggest things we do is we run Bookshelf, which is the lar largest uh, digital textbook platform in the world. Um, where we work with thousands of publishers to uh, aggregate over a million titles into a catalog of, of digital textbooks. And then we work with thousands of different institutions, um, both in the United States and then uh, increasingly abroad. We have users in uh, almost every country around the world um, to deliver those textbooks and other course materials to students. Um, uh, and with a real focus on access to those materials, um, you know, topics like accessibility are near and dear to our heart, as well as affordability. One of the, the biggest things that we try and do is, is save students a lot of money. As we all know, those textbooks can get really, really expensive. Um, and we were uh, very happy to save students over $60 million on their textbooks just in this last semester alone. Um, so access and affordability is core to, to what we do. Um, and then we're always looking for ways to, once students do have the course materials that, that they need, once they are able to read them, once they're able to afford them, what can we do to help them get the most out of those learning materials? Um, it's another huge part of what we do. Um, some of those things are, are features and tools that we develop ourselves, but there's also great opportunities to collaborate with partners like Hypothesis um, and you know, bring tools to students and teachers together um, that we really just couldn't do alone. Um, so you know, much like Alex was talking about uh, a pilot that they're working on with JSTOR, um, we, we did pilot um, with some real live uh, teachers and students this last semester the ability to highlight and annotate content inside of our bookshelf e-reader using the hypothesis tools um, to some really interesting data and some some great outcomes from that first live course. So certainly look forward to talking more about that um, and uh, excited for the conversation. Chris, I think you're muted. Oh. That was amazing. I don't even know how that happened. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> so let's hop into the, the, the Q&A here with you. I think we have to start off with uh, somewhat of a special question around, um, you know, what drew you into this, uh, this world of open social learning? Uh, why is this something that you're looking to pursue? I'd love to potentially start off here with Dan, because I think you even have a, 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 a small set of slides to talk through the Slack coalition. Um, so why don't we go ahead and start with you and I'll kind of pull that up. Great. Um, so the, uh, you know, kind of the way that this uh, got started for us, um, you know, we, we launched, uh, you know, we, we hypothesis story in, in, in two sentences is, um, you know, we, along with a lot of people um, has understood there to be the, you know, this opportunity to bring a kind of universal co collaboration conversation layer um, to the web and, and what's in it and launched, uh, built some open source software, brought it through the W3C standards process um, and then launched a service um, uh, using it. And the first, some of the first users um, um, that, uh, we had were um, uh, were in the classroom, uh, students, uh, teachers that were introducing this um, um, to their to their uh, students to be able to collaborate over text, um, uh, just using the the Chrome plugin. Um, and uh, you know, so as that usage grew, they started telling us um, what they wanted um, in order to for it to be better for them. 
one of the first uh, things that they asked for were uh, to build this into uh, the the learning management system to have a, um, plugins in a sense for you know Moodle and Canvas and and Blackboard, um, and so we we built those. Uh, and then they asked for uh, additional things, which we built. Um, but there was a um, over time, there was a consistent ask um, that they had, which was more a more difficult one for us to solve for. And that was, hey, this is great um, when it we're using it um, on a PDF that's been uploaded into Canvas or uh, on a file in Google Drive. Um, but we also use um, uh, you know platforms like Vital Source to um, deliver digital textbooks. Um, or, you know, we have publisher material that we use uh, in a native reader from Cengage or Pearson. Um, or, you know, we're using, you know, library materials like uh, those from JSTOR. Um, and, you know, but our teachers, you know, usually they would just point the student to the, the page in, in JSTOR. Now they've got to, you know, download that JSTOR article as a PDF and maybe re-upload it, which, you know, may not even be supported by the terms of service um, that are negotiated. And and when platforms like Vital Source, it, it may not really even be possible or easy at all to kind of download the thing as a PDF. So, um, so why can't, you know, what you're building just work there too? Um, and these were simple asks, um, but there's a really compl complex problem behind that. So how can you have something, it is this app that's authenticated in, inside the LMS, but can also uh, extend over these native content platforms um, and within and you know seamlessly without uh, you know the student even realizing kind of what's happening uh, in the background um, or the teacher. Um, so we um, started to to have uh, some discussions. Um, and if you go to the next slide. Uh, um, and uh, with um, a kind of a wide range of um, folks uh, in the market, um, uh, Nick here at Vital Source, Alex at JSTOR, and, and uh, many others like them, and realized that there was a, a shared interest in solving this problem collectively, um, and that it was a shared problem uh, that um, that needed to be, you know, kind of thought of in those terms. Uh, and so the idea to form a coalition um, to bring those shared interests together uh, was born. Um, we launched that last year. Um, it's called Social Learning Across Content. Uh, there's a website there called slackcoalition.org. And it's a very simple website. Um, but the, the powerful thing is that all of the members have shared um, a short video of them saying kind of in their own words why this um, kind of shared mission is uh, powerful for them. Um, and I think the, the powerful thing for us at Hypothesis and, and the others that were, have been pulling this together um, is that, uh, um, you know, that the, the voices, um, you know, are so clear um, and that the, the re reasons are um, ultimately the same, but, but uh, the perspectives, um, that the power is in the diversity of perspectives behind them. Um, next slide. So uh, at this point, we have, I think, about 22-ish, uh, 24 partners, something like that. Um, there's probably another 10 um, that are in discussions in addition to this that are that are coming soon. And they form a pretty wide um, range of uh, some of the players in this space across a wide range of different categories. Um, Obviously, major folks uh, that are, you know, um, major players in the commercial part of this space, Vital Source, EBSCO, ProQuest, uh, Cengage, uh, et cetera. Um, some of the not, you know, kind of powerful nonprofits um, like JSTOR, the Internet Archive, Hathi, Hathi Trust, um, uh, but, and also kind of stakeholder coalitions, a DAISY consortium uh, that focuses on accessibility. Um, and uh, institutions, uh, UC Davis, University of Illinois, and others that are have um, uh, you know pers uh, people and perspectives that have really brought um, some uh, value to to the coalition. Um, go ahead. Um, so 
Uh, I've kind of given you the context. Basically, the um, uh, we want to bring more interactivity to the classroom experience. Um, the goal is to keep the students engaged. Um, uh, and that interactivity is focused on learning materials and content that is supplied by you know, these uh, major providers that, that in the space that we all know. Go ahead. Uh, and the problem is that um, it's, you know, when you have a kind of a, in LMS terms, a third party application or a third party tool that is authenticated, it really t till now can only exert its influence within the narrow world of the learning management system and maybe a PDF that happens to be uploaded there, but it can't extend um, kind of outside the plat platform. Uh, and you know, the, you know diff so those different platforms may have their own tools, but those tools are different. Uh, and so the experience for teachers and students is different. And so we wondered, you know, can we, could we, can we solve this problem? Um, and, you know, the answer is we think so. Um, just in terms of um, a bit of kind of context about who are these content providers that are out there, um, there's, we, we separate them into some kind of some common categories. Um, and, you know, we think of this problem as if we can tackle the major providers in each of the primary categories, and focus on them first, um, and bringing them into the coalition and, and kind of in, engaging them as, in this shared mission, um, then we think we can solve, uh, fundamentally solve the problem. Uh, so learning management providers like Canvas and Blackboard, the EBSCO and ProQuest and the aggregators, OER providers, publishers, archives like JSTOR, uh, distri uh, e-text distributors like VitalSource, um, and then um, journals and uh, other kinds of scholarly uh, um, sources. Um, go ahead. So the, so the end product of this is a coalition. Um, uh, that will work together. Um, the goal is to first, you know, kind of come together and uh, agree on what on the share what we think the obstacles are, work on ways of eliminating those obstacles, and then do some uh, some POC, some proof of concept, in terms of doing this multi-party or cross-party integration. Um, obviously, we at Hypothesis are are doing some, um, but this is not limited to us. There are other tool providers um, and others that um, um, we want to see, you know, many integrations flourish. Um, the problem doesn't get solved if it's only a single vendor solution. Um, and uh, um, our kind of mantra here is to work in, work in the open, um, show our work, publish our findings, um, and make this kind of a free, free to participate, no, no barriers, no um, um, tolls. Go ahead. Uh, we have a really simple set of asks uh, for the coalition participants that we've put forward. Um, and that is number one, if you agree uh, that, that you agree with the vision um, and uh, enabling this, you know, focusing on the end user, uh, enabling uh, uh, consistent experiences, explore to, to invest in kind of exploring what that would mean for yourself uh, and the, the work that you would have to do um, to uh, to undertake this kind of vision within your own platform and, and to prioritize some of that, to collaborate uh, openly with others and, and agree to be public about um, uh, your involvement. Great. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Dan. And I think that's a great segue into the other folks on the panel here are people who have you know, made those commitments to this open vision. Um, and so why don't I turn it over to Alex to, to hear from you. What drew you to, to social learning, open social learning? Uh, thanks, Chris. And thanks, Dan. I'll, I think I'll do a similar thing to what Dan did, which is sort of tell a story over, over time. Um, so just thinking about very broadly uh, Ithaca's mission and our, our mission, we, we are, it is very deeply important to us to increase the impact and usage and engagement with the scholarship and content that we have because we believe education and, and informed population are the bedrock of democracy. It's absolutely vital. And um, we, we think encouraging that 
uh, is is deeply important to our mission. We we started off, you know, two and a half decades ago, um, showing that content that many people didn't look at or see, which was the back issues of journals, and was so uh, um, that that there was value in it if we could make it easily accessible and and uh, um, uh, and digital and, and available for everybody. And we've been successful enough that there have been a number of studies that open access content on JSTOR drives significantly more usage on, um, when it's on JSTOR than when the same content is available on other platforms. And we want to continue to take advantage of that and continue to increase the kinds of engagement that students and learners have when they're dealing with uh, academic content, when they're learning new ways of of looking at the world, um, uh, um, we, we we I believe strongly, and we believe strongly that annotation and social learning is one really exciting tool um, as you're doing that um, because um, it creates a community around the actual content, um, acknowledging that learning is 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 not a solo activity that you do alone, but it's a social one. It's one that you do in a classroom. It's one you do. Um, you know, standing on the shoulders of a long lines of other scholars or researchers uh, learning on things. Um, uh, and, and, you know, you could even say scholarship itself is a form of annotation and that every scholar is commenting on the work of the, 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 the scholar or researcher that came before him or her. Um, so we first partnered with Hypothesis, um, like, five or seven and a half years ago in 2015, I remember sitting in a room at the UT Austin. Um, the dog's name is Betty. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, uh, in UT Austin with Jeremy Dean. Um, and we built a, an interesting tool that combined the ability to use hypothesis to annotate uh, canonical poems from the poetry magazine um, with uh, scholarship that was about it. And it, it, it was a way to demonstrate that students and learners weren't just consuming the scholarly discourse, could, but could be a part of it and could orient that with, around the, the primary text. It, the scholarly discourse doesn't happen over there. You're, you're, you as a learner are a part of it. And we think libraries, um, which both house and preserve scholarship and the scholarly discourse and all of the knowledge that we have, and they also are, uh, and they also act as a tour guide to that discourse to any student who comes to their campus. We think because of the, that twin role, libraries are a ideal partner in exploring how to use digital methods um, like social uh, online social learning um, to help students uh, in today's world. Thank you, Alex. Nick, anything resonating so far? Or yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, you know, I think one of the the ways that um, you know Dan kind of framed the the challenge was around um, how do we drive that that degree of interactivity and engagement with the content, right? And and hypothesis is a really great way to do that. Um, I, I'd say that that mission is what drove us to to social learning. Absolutely, you know, we we're always looking for more and different and better ways to try to drive that interactivity. Um, you know, if you go back in time, um, you know, in, in vital sources history, you know, one of the things that we've seen jump out through the data, I'd say loud and clear, is that, you know, if, if all they're, you're able to do is give the student what I call a, a print under glass textbook experience, right? Um, they're not going to use it very heavily. They might not even buy it. Right? They might opt out of it. They're not going to get a lot of learning impact out of it. And you're not really taking advantage of all of the, um, you know, affordances that being in a digital world gives you to help those students learn better. So, um, you know, we're, we're always working on um, what we can do to, to further that student experience. You know, a, a nice example that's um, in a different part of what, what we do um, is we, we recently spent a lot of time and energy building out a new tool that allows us to automatically generate with AI some formative practice questions and layer them into the text study, study experience, right? That's one way to drive interactivity. You read a little bit of content, you reflect and see, did you understand what I just read or do I need to go back and reread? Um, hypothesis is another great way to trigger that same kind of moment of reflection, that little moment of learn by doing um, that we know, you know, is, is proven by learning science is gonna have a positive impact on the student learner experience. But instead of doing that with formative practice, we're able to do that with your peers and with your instructor and fostering that, that kind of social interaction. 
Um, so that's absolutely what what drove us to to wanted to do a partnership there together. Um, and then you know the the other interesting thing that I think is worth sharing is um, we've had the ability inside of our bookshelf platform to share your notes and highlights with a peer, or if you're an instructor, to share your notes and highlights with the students in your course since 2007. No one uses it. <laughs> it's 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 not uh, uh, it's not you know built with the same kind of intentionality around the user experience and you know around the kind of clarity of what this is for, right? That that hypothesis has. It's kind of a tack on. It's a bit of an add on in terms of the feature set. It doesn't have the same kind of capability of horizontally delivering the same user experience across a lot of different kinds of content modalities. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have the usage, and I'm not surprised it doesn't have the usage, right? It doesn't have the smooth LMS integration where an instructor can create kind of uh, rich and robust assignments around participating in that engagement. Um, and, you know, this is one of those places where, sure, we could go spend a whole bunch of time and energy and en engineering time and, and work trying to build that, or we can figure out how to do a, a partnership with someone that solved a lot of those problems together solve some problems for for teachers in that kind of horizontal way across content that we might not be motivated to do and deliver a better user experience for teachers and learners um, by integrating rather than trying to, to reinvent the wheel um, you know so there's there's a lot that, that kind of draws us to this you know feature area in general and then also it's just a really nice way to, to plug some specific gaps that we have in terms of our own capabilities where let's let the experts build that part <laughs> and then and layer it into our, our products to, to get the right thing out to our students if it's okay, I want to just like chime in or, or um, uh, um, uh, shout hallelujah to some of what Nick Nick was just say, saying. Um, I I love the the metaphor of you know annotation. You know, with, looking at the document under glass. Um, you know, when you look at you know we've done user studies where you're looking at researchers or, or students um, engaging with their material and. It is not under glass. It is it is a physical act to <laughs> grapple with the thing and to and to tear and to make physical comments and to really move between books and all of that. There is a really roll up your sleeves and kind of get messy um, uh, engagement that happens in the analog world. And I think too many of the um, uh, you know, first forays at annotation and, doc and and all of this, tried to make it too clean and too neat. And I think one of the things that social learning um, uh, and the, the classroom annotation that is being done now is it allows for some dynamism and messiness and, um, and, and operating in a variety of different ways that I think is really exciting. And that, that stands on, that uh, benefits from the fact that it is, cross-platform and doesn't, you know, I have this set of tools for JSTOR and I have to learn this, you know, where it's like jumping between WebEx and Zoom and go to meeting and all of that. There's a little bit of friction there that causes uh, difficulty every time. So um, a common standard is a benefit for all. Okay. Speaking of messiness, that seems like a good segue to talk about the classroom and pedagogy and things in practice. So, um, you know, Nick, at Vital Source, you have the luxury of working with, you know, hundreds of and thousands of institutions and thousands more instructors. Um, I'm curious to know what are some of the best practices that you've seen that are taking advantage of this ability to conduct social learning across content. Yeah, um, that's a, a great question. Um, so. You know, one of the things that um, I, I think is a, a bad habit we can fall into, you know, when, when you work with textbooks is starting to think of them as, um, you know, it's just this single monolithic packaged up thing and you're going to deploy it in a different course or to a particular institution. They're going to teach that textbook just the way that it's laid out, just the way that it's structured. And it's this kind of monolithic block in a blob. And it's always a mistake when you think that way, right? Sure, the, the textbook publishers went through a lot of work to, to kind of craft what they believe is a nice view of the curriculum and, and craft a, a, a helpful and useful flow through that material. But when you get out there and you actually talk to faculty, they're breaking it apart and they're slicing it together. And they don't think of it as I'm just teaching this textbook, right? They're teaching their course. And that may have an assigned textbook. They may even use most of it in the order of how they go through it in the, the published work. 
but they still think of it as their course, right? And they have a lot of intentionality around how they use that as an effective teaching tool. Um, and I thought that um, the the instructor that we worked with for our pilot with the, the bookshelf and hypothesis integration this last semester, um, she had a really, really great view. Sorry, I've got a three-year-old here with a police car uh, doing a quick interruption. <laughs> Henry, I've got to be talking on this, okay? Can you hand downstairs? Bye, Henry. Um, I'm going I'm I'm to do it with you. Um, it's okay. We'll be here when you get back. Hey, can someone come grab Henry? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh. My two and a half year old. He's saying he wants to help. Sorry, mm -hmm. one second. We are um, thanks to Grammy. Um, okay, so sorry, I was saying um, the, the faculty member we work with, uh, Dr. Allison Bernays at University of Minnesota, um, I thought she had a really um, great kind of point of view and mindset around how to use our tools together to effectively teach around the textbook, right? She wasn't just saying, hey, thanks for this tool. I'm going to drop my students into this user experience like have fun or go make four annotations or go, you know, do this. She really thought a lot about how it fit well into our course, how it fit well with her, her teaching and learning goals. And she had a, a really just thoughtful approach, right? She, she even was challenged this last semester with teaching the same course with the same textbook in both a fully remote asynchronous modality and a synchronous modality where she had her students kind of coming in for remote Zoom lectures. And she kind of crafted the hypothesis and annotation experience a little bit differently for each of those courses, right? With some really discrete goals and kind of discrete um, types of assignments and, and types of how she wanted that social um, annotation to play into the course, right? Um, so I, I just thought it was a really nice example, you know, we're, we're talking to her. I just learned a lot about the pedagogy of her course, right? About what she wanted to do, about how she saw these tools fitting into her teaching and learning. And you know what? What she did was able. She was able to take some um, in-class exercises mm -hmm. that, in her in-person courses, had been really, really successful for her in the past. Move them into the textbook, right? Facilitated by the hypothesis layer, and have that be a really uh, effective activity for her students, while also kind of reclaiming some of that class time and using that for some other purposes as well. Um, so it, it was just a really nice example of you know someone who didn't just kind of hear about some technology and blindly adopt it, but um, had a really kind of mindful, thoughtful approach to like, how do I implement this in practice with my students in my courses with the way I want them to learn? Um, and I think the the data showed that um, she did a really effective job. The, the students really got a lot out of it um, and were re really deeply engaged with both tools. You know, and Alex, I think you have an interesting perspective because if the library serves as an educational resource as well as a resource for num numerous other stakeholders. Um, how do you see these things working together? I almost pulled a Chris. Is um, that what we're going to call it now? I, I, I mean, universally, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so first of all, I'll just say I'm not a trained librarian, um, uh, so I can't or speak for speak for librarianship, but I can, you know, I can share what we, um, uh, uh, you know, what we've learned as we're working with librarians. Um, and, um, you know, my experience is that libraries are very bustling places. They're not quiet reflection in a carol. They're bustling places to gather, um, and they're they're places to gather. Um, they're a particular kind of place to gather on a campus either virtually or, or in, in person, you know, way back when I was a student, the groups that met in the library were, um, uh, were the study groups and the book groups. I'd, I'd meet with my Russian studies group um, and uh, we'd meet in the library. There were social gatherings, but they weren't frivolous. They were centered around um, uh, books or knowledge. Um, uh, you could almost call them a form of analog social learning. Um, and so it only makes sense that as those affordances turn to digital, that libraries are play a central role and and are a supporter of that. And, and I think there are two aspects of libraries that are um, and, and librarianship now that are particularly relevant here. And and the first is just many libraries or, or libraries are one of the places on a campus that are inherently cross disciplinary. Um, they 
They provide support across the different disciplines. And um, so if you're interested in learning, you know, how a historian does a particular thing or how a chemist does a particular thing, that's within the discipline. But as you, there are many skills, it, it's very important to have that cross-disciplinary um, pollination and many skills that span across those disciplines, whether that's a research mm -hmm. skill or writing skills um, or, or, or in introductory digital skills like text analysis or data literacy. Um, and libraries are increasingly providing those skills. And I think there's an opportunity for them to both use social, social learning to provide those skills and have that be one of the sets of skills that can be provided. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way. That's really quite um, yeah. illuminating to see it as a horizontal skill developer. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and using and leveraging and increasing the value of the content that they already have. They care a lot about the adoption rates and the usage and uh, of their materials. It's not only about, you know, uh, the shelves are fine, but they want to disseminate that information. And so, you know, social learning is a way to increase the impact of the collections that they, 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 they license and buy. Great. Well, if we, if Betty has anything else to say, uh, or if Nick or Dan have anything else to, to add to that. Um, the next few questions I have are really open to anyone. I'll potentially pick a, a couple people, but please feel free to jump on those and, and respond to your peers. Um, and as, just a quick reminder from the from our audience, we also have the Q&A panel. And so if you also have your own questions or your own thoughts to jump in, feel free to drop those too. Um, so let's move into this concept of the open part of social learning. Um, why, why go open? Why pursue a standard for this? Uh, and Dan, you spoke at length about the Slack coalition, so you're probably the king of this. Uh, I'd love to kind of get your thoughts. Um, I mean, the the reason um, you know we, you know, a lot of times, you know, we as you know vendors uh, trying to provide solutions um, think that the only way we can win is by um, doing something and then building a wall around it and protecting it so that nobody else can take advantage of the thing that we built um, because we put so much time and energy into it and maybe some money and, um, uh, and you know, that's, that's the kind of the mentality, um, build and protect um, and only share, you know, when, you know, there's a, there's a toll paid. Um, but I think, you know, the, the open source movement is, a uh, you know, uh, increasingly a thing that is showing all of us that there is a kind of a new kind of thinking, um, that there's a way to build um, shared things, um, standards, um, and to push for kind of shared values around interoperability um, and inclusiveness um, and, um, and still be successful. Um, um, almost, uh, you know, by... in. Uh, leveraging that openness as, you know, a form of, um, of commercial value and, and um, you know, kind of community value. So, um, um, you know, we're, we start, you know, first from our perspective as kind of lovers of the web um, and, you know, the web as that thing that came from a bunch of commercial implementations of online service providers like AOL and CompuServe. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, we were gifted this incredible thing, which has just radically tra transformed you know, life on Earth um, in a way that never would have been possible if all we'd had was, um, you know, a bunch of these, you know, kind of little siloed, um, you know, OSPs. Um, and I think we, you know, our goal was to try to, you know, see could we, could we bring that same thing to to thinking um, about on the social side. Um, and because uh, we want to see that that big outcome too, you know, we're citizens and humans that you know on the planet just like everybody else. Where else? So that's that's kind of the thinking behind it. It's pretty simple, um, and uh, you know, we're just delighted to that uh, some people seem to agree, and, and we're making a little progress. Nick is back channeling me about he's just jumping, ready to jump on this question. So I'm going to uh, pass it over to Nick. What what thoughts did you have? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I think uh, you know Dan talked a little bit about um, 
you know, the, the value of open and the, the value of, of standards and things, you know, one of the things that we've, um, I'd say just had a, a long history of, of success with, and, and they've, it's proven to be the right kind of strategic choice for us every time we've approached it, um, is going going open and, and going towards standards, right? So um, we uh, helped write the the spec for the EPUB three book format, and and you know we're really big champions for for driving adoption of that across publishers, which is a a win for students in terms of accessibility, a win win for students in terms of the the flexibility um, and interactivity of that content. That's just been a great a great win for us. Um, we've been um, huge 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 proponents of uh, the the standards coming out of uh, formerly IMS now now One Ed Tech. Um, you know, things like uh, learning tools interoperability. We, we have millions of students that launch into our products using LTI every single month. And, you know, we, you know, students would not have the, the you know, seamless access and degree of, um, you know, flexibility getting into all the tools that they, they use um, if that standard hadn't taken off and if that, that hadn't really reached the adoption it has. Um, one, one of our founders, uh, Rick Johnson, is actually the, the sitting board chairman of, of One Ed Tech. Um, you know, we leverage those same kinds of standards uh, to uh, pump uh, caliper data feeds with near real time data about what students are doing in our platform back to the institution so that they have that data for analysis and potentially early intervention. Again, like riding on that standard, um, you know, help solve problems across the ecosystem in a way where, you know, we we can aggregate that data and try and say, Hey, the only way that you can see this data is if you come into a vital source dashboard or like download our our data visualization tool or something um that's just not as powerful as if we can get you the data the way that you want it where you want it using open standards so that you can kind of color in that whole picture of the student journey um all in one place as the institution kind of i'd say where that data belongs frankly um so you know that's been a, a like a, a you know, a few different ways where kind of riding on those standards and building in the open has been really helpful to us. Um, and like I said, you know, every time um, we we go there, um, it's been a, a, a helpful, um, helpful, helpful tool for us. Um, you know, one other thing that I think is kind of worth worth mentioning, um, you know, a little bit related to the, the open side of the spectrum um, is, you know, the um, the complexity and the challenges that the institution and the faculty has to deal with when things aren't open. <laughs> um, you know, it, it can be really, really hard to manage an effective program or be an instructor trying to decide like, which of these thousands of tools do I wanna actually use in my course to achieve my goals in the course that I'm teaching this term? Um, and, you know, I think when you end up with all of the small kind of walled gardens and, and silos that um, I was talking about, you're just making the job really, really, really hard for the instructor and really, really hard for the institution to teach their courses effectively and manage their their platform effectively. Um, so, you know, if driving towards things like, um, you know, one coherent way to do something like social annotation, it's just going to simplify the picture. People are going to know where to go. They're going to know how to use it. They're going to know how it adds value to their content. They're going to know how it adds value to their student experience. Um, and I think that's a uh, Trying to simplify that that maze and that complexity is definitely something that that we work hard on at Vital Source, and I think um, standards has been a, a really nice way for us to do that. Um, there's definitely still room for us to improve, though. Anything else? Can can I chime in on on that? Because I mean, I, I think hypothesis standards based openness, the openness there is just one of the key reasons why we want to work with them. Um, JSTOR and Ithaca have been working really hard over the past maybe half decade to provide open and, and available infrastructure for libraries and institutions. For instance, um, we have a, um, a program called Open Community Collections that offers libraries um, uh, the ability to host and provide access to their library special collections freely right on the JSTOR platform and betting it where people are already doing, already doing research. So their special collections can, um, have, can reach more people and have a bigger impact. And we're providing that, that infrastructure. Um, we have a, another program uh, to expand access to the content that we have that we started during the pandemic uh, called Expanded Access where libraries and institutions get access to all of JSTOR's content um, 
uh, regardless of the number of individual collections you might you might own, um, just because of how difficult it is to get get content digitally, we're looking to extend that permanently um, beyond because the pandemic is not not receding. Um, for for social learning and annotation, um, I, I couldn't agree more with Nick's statement about all these walled gardens um, and individual um, uh, programs just carrying a huge burden for the individual learner and teacher, um, requiring, um, you know, creating a lot of friction. Um, you're having students having to learn five different auth systems and ways of logging in and navigating when what they should be learning is the course materials. And so if there's open standards that allow it to uh, interoperate while you know, JSTOR's publishers can get the usage and traction that they that they need, so that there's some some credit there. I think there's real real opportunities, and so I'd love to see you know this growing into a full you know archipelago of mission and community minded open standards based platforms um, with Hypothesis being really really central to that. Can we change the name of the coalition to the Social Learning Archipelago? I think that's I think you should. I think that was a missed opportunity and I'm really disappointed. Um, yeah, I mean, because the alternative is all of these individual programs were, are going to create, um, uh, you know, we'll be sort of fighting against each other and that leaves room for much larger organizations who might not share our community standards to essentially become de facto standards. Um, and that can hurt all of us. Um, Great. Any thoughts, Dan? Uh, I, I, I think we've, uh, um, I mean, I, I obviously resonate with, with what the, they've said. Um, um, I, think we've, I think we've covered this one. Right. Yeah, I want to take us into a slightly different direction that is somewhat adjacent to having an interoperable social learning layer, uh, which is a uh, a concept that many are probably familiar with as OER, or Open Educational Resources. Um, it's almost kind of like an interoperability later for the digital content itself. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious to hear from, you know, you folks, how does uh, OER fit into the broader publishing landscape? Uh, and how do you see it working here uh, within the classroom? Alex, what are your thoughts? So, I, I don't know that these will be especially uh, well thought out, but I, I, I want to, you know, I think it's worthwhile to go back to something Nick said earlier, where he talked about, um, you know, how teachers engage with textbooks and um, as, as not, you know, word from on high that must, as a set of instructions, as opposed to, um, you know, individual components of a recipe that they're making and they're making that recipe, um, you know, kind of on the fly because they're that it's their classroom, it's their 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 it's their thing that they're cooking, and I think OER is an amazing framework that sort of reifies that um, uh, creativity and um, uh, uh, an active um, teaching, making making the teaching uh, the, all the work that goes into putting into a class, turning that into materials that you can then use, but then other people can also, you know, dive in and reshape themselves. And I think that's incredibly valuable and really, really important. And I, and I think there's opportunity for um, a lot more infrastructure supporting that right now, because it, there are some challenges because inherent to it, because if the inherent goal is um, remixability, uh, and not taking the cookie cutter, then helping people find all of the, the ones that are most helpful to them and navigate all of that can be really challenging. I, I think there's opportunity for, you know, annotation and some sort of discovery tools that make it possible to navigate that and reuse and reshare um, that, that, mm -hmm. that, that could be really interesting. And, and I'll also say, um, well, maybe I'll stop there. I'll, I'll stop there before I get distracted. Uh, Nick, what do you think? I, I think that's well said. You know, I, I think the 
um, you know, OER is one of those topics where I feel like the the pros and the cons are quite clear, right? That you know, the the pros when it's implemented well, when it has the kind of properties of, of remixability and and modularity and reuse. Um, and low cost for students certainly resonates with us, right? There's, there's a bunch of wonderful things about OER, um, but the challenges around uh, discovery and knowing what to adopt and understanding if it's high quality, understanding if it's out of date, is it well maintained? Is it easy to implement in my course? Are there all of the um, kind of ancillary components that go along with a textbook or a, a publisher courseware product that help me teach my course effectively? Um, being able to, to kind of put together the OER jigsaw puzzle with content that's really high quality and aligned with what you want to teach can be really hard. In the cases where you can do that or where you have the, the time and energy to, to, to kind of sift through and, and find what you need or where you work with a, um, you know, a, a partner, maybe like an OpenStax, who kind of puts a lot of that together for you, um, you know, it can be a really, really great win for, for teachers and for students. Um, it's you know I, we don't do a, a ton with OER at Vital Source. I should say we we do distribute some uh, OER textbooks and materials mm -hmm. through our platform. Um, it's more a, a trend that we I think, keep tabs on and try and understand: is there a place where we can really come come in and help here? Um, but it's you know if someone is able to solve those those problems around discoverability, around powering that kind of remix and reuse, around helping instructors understand the the quality bar. Um, I could certainly see it, it having a, an enormous impact. Great. One thing that I heard that you had mentioned, Alex, is how it kind of uh, having some of this standardized allows the instructors to essentially focus on the creative part of that process. Yeah. I actually think that was something that I'm excited about when it comes to the Slack Coalition for Social Learning and Annotation is the same thing is that it, you know, all the guts are taken care of. And now we, we can actually see more innovation in the area, not less. Um, yeah, you want, I mean, you want the instructors to be able to create their own, you know, Spotify lists of syllabi, uh, where they're, they're essentially piecing together the materials. This is how I go about creating, you know, talking about introducing this particular material and then letting people listen to each other's mix lists. Um, and, you know, much of that content could be open, but it doesn't necessarily have to be if I'm teaching, you know, um, American literature, I'm, I'm not going to stop in 1920, 20, five or whatever. So um, I, I think it's important to be able to, that remixability and that that those standards would allow for that kind of common uh, discovery and sharing mm -hmm. of, of, um, uh, of uh, you know, the, the, as the, with, uh, uh, the, the teacher as the tour guide of the subject material. Yeah. Well, and, and the shared um, capabilities and feature set matters too, right? You know, one of the things that we've heard from, um, folks when we talk to them about uh, how they're using OER, how they might use OER in some of their courses, um, is they'll point out you know, often, hey, here's a phenomenal resource, but the only way I can give it to my students is it's over here, it's hosted on this website and that's it and that's all that it works. And, they're ask and they'll ask us questions like, how can they use that through your bookshelf iOS app so they can download it and read it offline while they're on the train? And our answer is, well, they kind of can't do that right now, right? It's such, it's a very fragmented landscape, um, but they would love to have the sa those same kinds of capabilities. They would love to have the same kinds of capabilities we've been talking about today in terms of social learning. And, you know, that, that kind of join of the fragmented content landscape with the fragmented tools landscape, that's really the thing that if you solve that, you're doing something really powerful. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I, we're getting closer to time here, and I'd love to, you know, leave some time at the end for the audience to to leave some questions as well. So I am going to move on to um, everyone's favorite question, which is, "What is your favorite social read? What's the best piece of content that you like to read together?" So someone's going to have to jump in here and talk, but if no one does, then Dan, you're going to have to jump in here. And talk. What do you think, Alex? What do you think, Nick? I nominate Dan. <laughs> uh, I'm yeah. I'm uh, go ahead, Alex. Well, I don't know if this is a social read. So I, you know, I just a couple things that I don't. I don't know that I would call something a social read. So that that's why one reason why the question question is hard. I'll, I'll but I'll give 
two sorts of examples that that might spark something. So one, I remember last year, it just happened that like a dozen people in my office were all reading virtual office. Nobody was in, in person. Uh, Clara and the Sun by Ishiguro, um, which amazing new novel, everybody should read it. And just the act of everybody reading and discovering and sharing just rose um, uh, and, and learning that together just changed our my um, relationship with the book. And um, we were doing a project at the time or having some discussions with, I don't know how many people here know, um, but if you don't, you should, um, the Freedom Reads Project, which is um, uh, funded by Mellon, led by a gentleman named Dwayne Betts, who is a genius. Um, and it is a project to provide a library of printed materials um, inside of uh, like a, 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 um, a US prisons. So he's creating a library of materials and it's based on Dwayne's time um, on the inside where he was in solitary and somebody passed him a poetry book and it changed his life. And he's now a published poet and a lawyer and an amazing, amazing man. Um, and they did a series of round tables um, as they were trying to decide the 500 books to include in this library where they would bring together authors and writers. And I got to join one of them for some reason uh, where we would talk about the book that mattered most to you in your life. Like what is the book that you care about that you think everybody in the world should read? And it was just an amazing way to get to know people and to see the diversity of those books and to think about then sharing them with people who have very little access to books. It was a tremendous project and I'd encourage Ender's Game. That was on the list. Um, uh, all right, that was my, I don't know if that's a social read or not, but it, it seemed relevant. Sounds social. Uh, well, I'm just gonna go with an old favorite, um, which is, uh, it, it kind of relate. You know, the one of the first articles that came out um, it's actually in 1945 called uh, as we may think um, uh, talking uh, kind of imagining both the web and Wikipedia and uh, in a kind of collaborative annotation way before it was obviously ever invented um, uh, which is a, a bit of a um, you know in a canonical text in in our world um, uh, is still, uh, available on the Atlantic, um, you know, as a, as a public document and um, now has been annotated um, by lots of people with some really um, uh, super insights. And so that's, that's definitely one of my favorite kind of meta um, reads. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but my other favorite one is just, uh, you know, kind of the one that's in, in front of me, you know, on more of a daily basis, like um, the thing that people are talking about today um, or, uh, you know, seeing some of the fascinating um, annotations on on class texts, um, and just seeing how how the conversations are unfolding. So, yeah, oh, I love that. Well, great. I have one more question for you all. This is a question for everyone. So we'll kind of go around the table. Um, we'll, so what's next? Uh, so what is the you know what's the next move that that uh, you're making in the open social learning and how can we help? How can the audience get involved? And yeah, take it away, Alex. Uh, so as I mentioned at the very beginning, um, we are currently working towards a pilot project similar to the one we're following in Nick's uh, um, illustrative footsteps. Um, uh, and we will be uh, doing that pilot at a handful of institutions, universities in the fall. Um, uh, we're selecting universities now. Um, uh, so if you are at one and you want to strongly advocate for your school, then, um, you know, I stray a forcefully written, eloquently written, um, note, uh, may sway us. Um, but we're selecting those now and that's really where we're putting our effort. And then we hope to expand that, um, beyond, um, uh, the pilot, assuming that all goes well. And I'd encourage anybody to uh, shoot me an email or reach out to me on on, on social media uh, with any questions or, or suggestions for how we how we move forward and do this. I'll I'll just echo that on on my side. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we we do have uh, the integration between our tools up and running now, and we did have that live in some some courses that ran this previous semester. 
and we are looking for more. Um, so we're, we're planning to have more courses live with the, the integration integrated set of tools this fall. Um, and if you want that to be a course at your institution or a course that you're teaching, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, especially folks who are familiar with both Hypothesis and Bookshelf, which I think is probably quite a lot of folks, right? There's a, a lot of folks who have used both of our tools already. Um, you know, that's just a perfect candidate to say, what can I do with these tools together? And I'm sure you'll come up with some, some great ideas about how you could use that effectively in your course. So um, don't be shy. I think Chris is gonna flash up my, my mm -hmm. email and, and Twitter in a couple of minutes here. Um, feel free to reach out. We'd love to hear from you. How about you, Dan? What's next for the coalition and what, how can people help? Um, well, mostly there's a lot of uh, kind of the hard work um, um, of now that there's some maybe some examples um, and the partners have come together and we've done some of that kind of initial uh, advocacy um, and outreach. Uh, I think now we need to come together and say what are what are some of the things we've learned from these early POCs and how can we start to generalize these towards some kind of recommendations and best practices um, so that there is a, a bit of a playbook here for, for others to follow, suggestions for people building content platforms in terms of how to make them more kind of social ready um, so that this uh, kind of capabilities can hang on them and be um, uh, incorporated into them uh, a bit easier. Um, and, uh, so that's, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, fun, uh, fun work, but, um, you know, some, some interesting questions ahead of it. Great. So that's all from my questions. I am, as Nick mentioned, going to pull up, um, a quick slide as, um, as we mentioned, there's a lot going on. Uh, there's ways to get in involved and Nick and Dan and Dan by me forcing him. And that's not true. Uh, I just didn't ask for permission like normal. Uh, Alex and, and Nick and Dan have graciously offered their contact info. So if you've heard something today that you really resonated with and you're, hey, I have an idea there, or I think you're missing something, um, or you want to be involved in one of these pilots, uh, we'd love your feedback. We'd love your ideas. Please reach out. Um, and then as I mentioned, if there's you know, thanks. If maybe you don't get these down, my email's there. I'm happy to kind of pass a uh, pass a uh, similar requests along as well. Um, but with that, I'd love to turn it over to the audience. If there um, are any questions that haven't come in yet, this is, would be a great time. I think that by like at the very minimum, we need someone to ask what my kid's name is. What's your kid's name? My name, her, her name is Howie, Anna Howard Shaw, and she's the best thing that has ever happened. Not that Henry's not great. <laughs> I well, can get you back in here to ask some questions if, if the audience doesn't have any. Sorry, what was that? <laughs> oh, you can get it, that would actually, you also have a guitar, don't you, sitting around that we could, and then Alex, you can jump on the piano. We can take requests. I think his question crowd. would be, 95% sure his question would be about fire trucks. So it'd be a bit of a non sequitur. What? Um, yeah. I just want to say thanks, Chris, for leading us uh, um, through the, um, you know, through this exploration um, and to everybody for attending. Yeah. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, this has been super insightful and, and a lot of fun. So uh, feel free to reach out contact information's on the screen there. And we'll looking forward to hear from you. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thanks all.